So now that we've covered the three respiratory structures that were initially mentioned, and those were body surfaces, gills, and tracheal systems, we're now going to be focusing on the respiratory system that's seen within us as humans. And we as humans utilize lungs as our respiratory structure, but we're generally going to just entitle this next flowchart Human Respiratory System 1. And what we want to focus on and look at as we're going through this uh, idea of the human respiration is figure 42.24. This looks at mammalian respiratory systems, but that really covers what we're going to be talking about in the human side of things as well. So the human respiratory system, specifically the lungs, are going to be the main structure. So the lungs are going to be, as you probably already know, part of the respiratory system. They're going to be the main part of the respiratory system because they are the main respiratory structure. Lungs are going to consist, uh, they're going to basically make up the majority, or they're going to make up the main part of the respiratory system, but the respiratory system will also include um, the lungs and a tube system that will work together. So lungs plus tube system make up the overall respiratory system. So lungs can't work on their own. They actually need the help of some tubes, and we'll get to the idea of what these tubes mean a little bit later. The lungs themselves, another thing to keep in mind, as compared to the other respiratory structures that we've seen, the lungs are not in direct contact. They are not in direct contact with other parts of the body. With other parts of the body. So let's say you have these feet, right? They're all the way at the bottom of your body. And the lungs we know are what's going to allow for oxygen to effectively enter the body and into the blood. What is going to happen to those feet that are nowhere near this area at which gas exchange is occurring, known as the lungs? How are they possibly going to get the gas that's coming into the system? Again, we need to remember that the respiratory system is intimately connected to the circulatory system. Therefore, the lungs, as a part of this respiratory system, absolutely, absolutely need the circulatory system, CS, in order to transport gases. Whereas the respiratory system is going to do a very good job of absorbing gases and exchanging gases, if you want to transport gases throughout areas of need within the body, you need that circulatory system. Therefore, it's important to reiterate that the circulatory system and the respiratory system work in cohesion. They work together. They are a very dynamic duo that do their job very much uh, uh, connectively. So that covers our initial look at our human respiratory system. What we're now going to be doing is the basic path of respiration in humans. The basic sort of beginning towards the end of respiration. How we get air from the outside to the inside. And in order to understand that, you have to just look at the different structures that present themselves within a human respiratory system. Because when you look at the structures from point A all the way to whatever point at which you have the actual exchange occurring, that's going to give you the outline and pathway of how respiration happens. And it all begins initially at step one, structure one, which would be the nostrils. So the nostrils are, of course, a part of your nose, and this is essentially the place where air enters the body. And as it enters the body, it has to then go through the nostrils and into the next respiratory structure, and that would be number two. The next respiratory structure would be the nasal cavities. So these are very much very close to the nostrils, thus they're next on the line of structures that are involved in respiration. And their job is to uh, be a place at which air warms itself, and when air warms itself, it also gets a little more moistened. This is a theme of respiratory structures. You need a moist environment for sufficient diffusion of gases, and that's what we're doing in the nasal cavities. We're making sure that we moisten this gas and air, all of the air that's entering us, and in putting it into an environment that's going to be successful later on when we need uh, that oxygen to definitely be in a moist environment. So we have nostrils, we have nasal cavities, and then where do we go? The nasal cavities lead into the third structure known as the pharynx. So number three would be the pharynx. This is a structure we've seen before. Where did we see it? We saw it during digestion. Because what we know is that the pharynx leads into the esophagus, right? The pharynx leads into esophagus, 
and that's uh, going to lead overall into the digestive system. But that's not a focus to us right now. What's a focus to us? A focus to us is the respiratory system. So what's the structure that the pharynx leads into? This is the hallway, right, to respiration and digestion. It actually is going to also lead into the larynx, and that's what we want to focus on. That's the next step. It leads into the larynx, L-A-R-Y-N-X, and that leading into the larynx is via, actually, that glottis structure. Because if you remember, what happens during swallowing? When you have swallowing, the epiglottis, that structure, that flap of tissue, that epiglottis during swallowing uh, sufficiently covers the glottis to ensure that you don't choke. So covers, glottis, just to remind ourselves, during swallowing. And why is that? Well, we want to make sure nothing goes down the wrong tube. During digestion, you want it to go down this tube, the esophagus. During respiration, you want air to go down this tube, or this area, I should say, the larynx. If you have a mix match, you're going to have choking, and therefore, in order to prevent any sort of interactions, haphazard or bad interactions between what's being swallowed and what's being breathed in, you make sure you have a nice epiglottis flap of tissue to block and ensure the right bolus, let's say, that food goes to the right area and air goes to the right area. So that's our pharynx. That's our next stop. It leads into the larynx, which is now the fourth structure we want to talk about. So number four, we have also the larynx. So the larynx is going to be a chamber. So we'll say that the larynx is equal to a chamber surrounded and supported by a cartilage wall. So it's very much made of cartilage. Surrounded plus supported by a cartilage wall. So as this structure, the larynx, represents itself in this cartilage form, what we're going to also notice about the larynx is the fact that this is going to be the site of vocal cords, things that I'm using right now. So vocal cords are interesting because these are just going to be, structurally speaking, they're just elastic folds of tissue. They're nothing more than that. But where it gets interesting is when you look a little bit deeper in terms of how vocal cords function. As elastic folds of tissue, structurally speaking, what happens is you're going to have air. So when air passes over these elastic folds of tissue, passes over them, so we have air that's breathed in and it passes over these tissues, they actually vibrate. They have this sort of frequency that they exhibit. This gives us our characteristic voice. Everybody has a characteristic voice, right? And the amount of vibration when air passes over that larynx, that vocal cord, at vocal cords that have the elastic folds, you get this characteristic and very specific vibration event and overall, all of this is actually connected to voluntary muscles. These voluntary muscles, like any other voluntary muscles in your body, need to be trained in order to use them effectively. So initially, as a little infant or as a little growing toddler, you can't really use these voluntary muscles that well, but you're trying your best. Eventually, you get to the point where you are able to speak very effectively. You're able to say very uh, specific things. You're able to say a word like voluntary and utilize the correct vibrations, the correct uh, voluntary muscle contractions that occur here to give what is known as the correct tension in your voice. And tension at these elastic folds of tissue, at these voluntary muscles, part of your vocal cord, is what gives a very specific pitch of sound. So we'll write that down. So when I scream or if I speak highly, the tension is different than if I speak very softly. And that's what gives um, the overall sort of sound of voice that uh, comes out of somebody's mouth when they're speaking. So that's our short look at how speaking occurs functionally over here. It's all at the larynx area. Again, you need this air actually. Air is a big part of making sure that speaking happens correctly. In addition, another important thing to note is that the larynx is going to be the site of a major cough reflex. A reflex is something you can control, it's involuntary. So we have both a voluntary control of tension, of a voice, of speaking, and also an involuntary uh, look at the cough reflex, in which 
let's say you mess up. Let's say you're talking and you're breathing and you're eating, right? Sometimes you get materials that go into the glottis, that glow in, go into the wrong tube. So any materials in glottis, and the technical term here is hacked up, are going to be hacked up. They're going to be coughed out immediately. And that's why you have that very immediate, uncontrollable, involuntary cough reflex if, let's say, you're drinking water and then you start laughing uncontrollably, right? And that's going to be because you're breathing in so much air as you're laughing that the air and water mix and go into the wrong place. You get that cough reflex immediately. So that covers number four. Remember, this is a pathway of air that we're talking about. Nostrils, air, nasal air, pharynx air, larynx air, where's air now going? Air is now supposed to go to, after going through the larynx, the trachea. So that is step five, structure five as well. The trachea is commonly referred to as the windpipe within the respiratory system. The trachea will be or represent a very characteristic air duct. Remember how he said it's the lungs and a tube system? This is where the tube system really starts because it's a duct, it's sort of like a tube, and it's an air duct that goes from the larynx, which was our previous structure, so it makes sense that it goes from the larynx to all the way the thoracic cavity. This is the first time we're mentioning the thoracic cavity. The thoracic cavity is just a fancy way of saying the chest cavity or the chest area. The chest area is where the magical and mighty lungs are located. We'll talk about those in the next video, but that's just this is the reason why we have a trachea, in order to get to the lungs, which are found within the thoracic cavity. So it makes sense to have a pipe an air duct that goes from the larynx area, this is very much still near the neck area, the throat area, all the way down into the chest cavity. That's the trachea. The trachea itself, structurally speaking, will also involve cartilage because it will have C-shaped cartilage. That's really what it looks like when you look at it underneath the microscope. It has a C-shaped cartilage, very hard to say, um, embedded within it, and this allows for support so it ensures the integrity and uprightedness of the trachea and the windpipe, making sure that it successfully acts as an air duct. And overall, the trachea will then continue this idea of being a part of the tube system because it itself will divide into two separate bronchi. Bronchi is the plural of bronchus. So there are two, there's one bronchus on the left side, one bronchus on the right side, two bronchi that originally come from the trachea. They branch into two bronchi and these two bronchi are going to directly now lead to the lungs. They lead to the lungs and that's what we'll look at when we continue our discussion of the human respiratory system in the next video.